everyone uh okay so on monday right on not monday yo i might even say monday on tuesday so let me just try to reduce my sound uh so on um on tuesday right on tuesday we're gonna have uh, time for questions so if you have questions uh remember we said that if you have questions send them to dalito or you send them to kilebo hile or yeah so if you have questions you send them to dalito or you send them to kilebo hile or you send them to my prayer uh, i haven't seen my prayer on the live today but yeah you send your question to those three people and you make sure that when you send a question you are there on the day because when we read your question we want you to be there uh, right so we are going to like what we promised last week um add guests if it's your turn for your question we we add you as a guest and you ask your question with everyone listening and we try to answer the question right oh yeah dalito is lifting up their hands they say yeah this is me so okay people of god um <clears throat> so we've been talking about atonement uh where did we end we've been talking about atonement uh, uh we've been talking about atonement today i wish you know what I, I because i feel like i've been okay i'm a teacher of the word but i feel like for the past two sessions i've been teaching a lot focusing on on just one topic focusing on just Christ. So I I wish if if we were here physically I would ask people <laughs> I'd be asking people what have you heard? What have you heard from the last two live sessions that we had? So we've been talking about atonement, we've been talking about how the Christ comes uh to fulfill the sacrificial system that stood for years. And we were saying that God could not remove the old covenant without fulfilling it. Do you understand? God could not just come and change things without fulfilling the old covenant. So Jesus Christ had to come as a lamp of sacrifice, just as the law of Moses prescribed that for sins to be forgiven, a lamp should be slain. So Jesus Christ had to come as the lamp of God to be slain, to be sacrificed. And we looked at a lot of things, people of God. We looked at um, Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 10. We looked at how scriptures say that the problem with the old sacrificial system was that it couldn't make the worshippers there unto perfect. We looked at how scripture also says that it was impossible for the blood and goats to um, free people from their sin. We looked at, we looked at many things. We looked at even how... Um, on the last live, we looked at the fact that when it was now time for the sacrifice, right? When it was time for the sacrifice, um, they had to find two goats, one for the bent offering and one for the um, sin offering. And we looked at the fact that during the time when Jesus Christ was killed, during that time when Jesus died, there were two of them. There was Barnabas and there was Jesus Christ. And they all stood before uh, the governor at that time, before the high priest and them. And they had to cast lots. People had to decide who should be crucified. And the people chose Jesus. Okay, I know that maybe when I'm explaining this for people who are not there on the live, it will not make sense. But um, if you really want to understand what I'm talking about, you have to watch the, the, the last live. right? So today, um, I want us to continue from, from here. Um, how that... There's a part that I wanted to include on my notes, but I didn't last time. So we're just going to start from there. So um, we also say that the lamp that had to be slain, the lamp that had to die for the sins of the people, it had to be, um, it had to be blameless. It had to be spotless. It had to be without fault. It had to be perfect. So there was no blemish that was supposed to be found in the lamp of sacrifice. And Jesus Christ comes as the lamp of sacrifice. And we know how that scripture says about Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ was here in the flesh, but yet without sin. Why does Jesus Christ come here, live, and yet he is without sin? It's because the lamp of sacrifice, he knew what was required of him. What was required of him, of him to be that lamp that cleanses the sins of the world? He had to live a sin-free life. Um, yo, am I having network issues? I just saw a blip there. Um, so Jesus Christ said to come and become a spotless lamp, a lamp that has no fault, a lamp that has no fault. So I want us to start reading from uh, Matthew 26, Matthew 26, verse 59, Matthew 26, verse 59. Are we there? Matthew 26, verse 59. Mm. Matthew 26, verse 59 says, 
Now the chief priests and the elders and all the council sought false witness against Jesus Christ to put him to death, but they found none. Yea, though many false witnesses came, yet they found none. You understand? So the scripture there makes it clear that as Jesus Christ is about to be crucified, so the lamp that has to be crucified has to be inspected by the high priest. The high priest must check. It was Aaron's duty to make sure that before a lamp is slain to God, it must be checked, thoroughly checked, that it, it has no spot, nothing, no blemish. So Jesus Christ also stands there now in front of the high priest. And the high priest is trying to find fault with Jesus. It's like they're trying by all means to make Jesus not qualified to be the lamp, not qualified, but they are doing this without even knowing what they are doing. And scripture says that they look for false witnesses, but they found none. They tried by all means, but they found none. Why? Because Jesus Christ was the ultimate sacrifice. He had no fault. According to God, God knew that this one was the only one who could uh, manage to be crucified without ever having sinned, not even once. Because the, it is required of the lamp of sacrifice to be like that. You know, we also looked at the part where scripture says uh, in First Corinthians chapter 2, where Paul says we speak with the wisdom of God. And this is the wisdom of God. The wisdom of God is like this, that if the princes of this world knew, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. We're looking at the fact that uh, Paul says if the princes of this world knew what they were doing, crucifying Christ, they would not have done it because they didn't know that by killing one man, Jesus Christ, they were bringing many sons. They were bringing many like him. They didn't know that he had to die so that people can be born again through him. So that now millions all over the world shall carry the power that he carried. Many millions all over the world shall become sons to God just like he was a son. So that millions all over the world could become like how Christ was. Do you understand? So Paul says the princes of this world did not understand the wisdom of God because if they had known it, they would not have killed him. They would have preferred Jesus to live alone as one man, knowing that they only have one Jesus who goes around healing the sick. They only have one Jesus who goes around casting devils. They only have one Jesus who goes around resurrecting the dead. So they crucify him not knowing that the, as they are doing that, they are empowering more. Do you understand? They are empowering more. They are empowering you. They are, they are giving God the keys to have many sons who shall rise up and be like Jesus Christ. You understand? So uh, we are saying Jesus Christ stands as the lamp of God. He is being inspected by the high priest and he stands as the lamp of God without sin. Blameless. Because that's how the lamp of sacrifice should be. That's how the lamp of sacrifice should be. So First Peter chapter 2 verse 22. First Peter chapter 2 verse 22. Are we there? First Peter chapter 2, verse 22, speaking about Jesus Christ. Peter says, speaking about Jesus Christ, who did not sin. He says about Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ did not sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Who, when he was um, rev reviled, he reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him who judged righteously. Who, who on his own bear our sins in his own body on a tree? that we being dead to our sins we should live unto righteousness by whose stripes we are healed first peter chapter 2 verse 22 first peter chapter 2 verse 22 says speaking about jesus christ it says about jesus christ that there was no guile in his mouth do you understand it says there was no guile in the mouth of jesus christ there was no bad speech there was no bad language there was no fault there was no sin found in him why is there no guile why is there no fault why is there no sin found in him is because he understands he's the lamp of sacrifice all his life he's living his life as one who's being prepared to die for the sins of the world and the the the, the lamp that has to be chosen for the sins of the world has to be sure it's like the high priest has to make sure that he has no fault so listen the duty of the high priest is not to just qualify any go any lamp and say yeah this one's fine his duty is to check thoroughly so that's why the fault that the, the high priests, they don't know, but they are just checking Christ thoroughly. They are trying to find blemish. They're trying to find fault, but they can't find. And Peter comes to confirm and says, Christ did not sin. There was no guile found in him. And then I like what verse 24 says. Verse 24 says, who on his own body bore our sins in his own body on a tree. So it says, speaking about Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ took our sins on his body. People of God, these are truths that you need to understand. He took the sinful nature 
remember what we read about from Romans chapter 3, uh, where the scripture says that uh, there was something that God wanted to achieve through the law, but uh, God could not achieve that thing through the law because the law was weak through the flesh. And God did what he wanted to achieve through Christ. Because Christ became flesh and blood like we are, and Christ condemned sin in the flesh. Do you understand? So Peter comes in to say that now Jesus Christ did indeed bear our sins on his body. On his body, he took away the nature of sin, the root. He uprooted sin to the point that now if we as people of God would believe right and understand what the death of Jesus Christ really means, the death of Jesus Christ doesn't only mean that, yeah, our sins are forgiven. No, it means that even what makes you sin is dealt with. The root of sin is uprooted. Do you understand? It's like I remember explaining that after man fell at the garden, this was man, right? See my hand as man. This was man. And this other hand was sin. Sin had come into man and found roots. Sin had clung unto man. Man could not run away from sin. No matter how much man tried running away from sin, it was not possible. Because the fall of Adam at the garden, it opened the door. Do you understand? It opened the door that could not be closed by the blood of goats, by the blood of bulls, by the blood of anything. It could not be closed. The only sacrifice that could close that door was the sacrifice of the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who according to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, he bore our sins on his own body. Listen, it goes on to say that, that we being dead to sins should live to righteousness. So Jesus Christ bears our sins on his body so that we who are dead to sin, now we can live a life of righteousness. All of a sudden, those people who were like the poorest of them all in the neighborhood, all of a sudden, now they are rich. That's what Christ did. He bore our sins on his own body so that we being dead in sin, now because we receive this Jesus Christ in our lives and we descend his death and resurrection, now we start living unto righteousness. Something that was impossible from uh, generations past is possible now in our dispensation. Okay, let's move on. Let's move on. So, so they take Jesus Christ, right? They take Jesus Christ and uh, people of God. Let me ask a question. Actually, though, we don't have time for questions, but this was going to be fun. I wanted to ask, where was Jesus Christ crucified? What was the name of the place where the, the, Jesus Christ was crucified in? Okay, let me just give you 20 seconds. What was the name of the place where Jesus Christ was crucified? And as I wait, I'll be drinking my water. What was the name of the place which Yo ah Dalitso I Dalitso knows too much guys? Mm. So Jesus Christ was um crucified in Golgotha. So Golgotha was like a, a rocky place, like a mountain a, a hill, like a rocky hill, that's what they say. And Golgotha was and Golgotha was uh <laughs> I Dalitso knows too much. <laughs> so so Dalitso Listen to me, I want to say Golgotha, now I'm, I'm saying Dalitso was, uh, Golgotha was like a, a hill. So this is what I want you to understand. So in the old covenant, right, in the old covenant, whenever a lamp was to be sacrificed, it was sacrificed on, uh, the blood was to be sprinkled on the mercy seat. So the mercy seat was like, there was like an altar, like an altar-like thing. Do you remember how Abraham, when he was about to sacrifice his son Isaac, he created an altar. So the, the reason why Jesus Christ gets crucified on a hill, it's because that hill on that day, it represented an altar. It represented a place where a, a sacrifice... Uh, <laughs> uh, so the, the, that hill where Jesus Christ gets crucified, it represented an altar where a sacrifice has to be put on an altar. And when a sacrifice is put on an altar, then it's, it's to be received. So Jesus Christ gets put on that hill in Golgotha. Golgotha stands as an altar that God is ready to accept a sacrifice from, right? So this is, what, this is something that I want you to understand, right? Uh, good evening, Tandega. So this is what I want you to understand. People of God, listen, listen, listen. This is a revelation that changed my life many years ago. So I don't know how to explain. So when Jesus Christ gets crucified, right? Um, he gets crucified in Golgotha. Golgotha is like a hill, like a mountain like this, right? So the cross of Jesus Christ gets put here, right? I don't know how to illustrate. Oh, okay. Let me just try to find something to use to illustrate. Um, okay, yeah. Okay, so the cross of Jesus Christ stood like this, right? Of course, it was a cross. It had like those things. I don't have those things, right? So it was a cross, right? So it was a cross. So the cross 
<laughs> the cross starts all the way from it it starts from the ground it starts from the earth and it goes all the way up right okay not all the way up up to heaven but it just like it at a distance going all the way up so this is what i want you to understand so what the cross of jesus christ meant that day was that um jesus christ was suspended on the air on the cross do you understand his cross starts from uh, the ground and it goes all, all up into like the air right so jesus christ stands as the sacrifice who is here he stands as a sacrifice here so what the cross of jesus christ represented was it represented it was like a when the scripture says Jesus Christ is a mediator of a new covenant, it means Jesus Christ stands in between men and God. So the cross of Jesus Christ starts from the ground and it goes up to the air, right? So Jesus Christ is the one at the center. Do you understand? Christ was hanging here at the cross, being the mediator, being the center of God and man. Now Jesus Christ is coming to bring peace between God and man. So his cross is hanging at the center. People of God, I don't know how to explain. Romans chapter 5 verse 1 says, seeing that we have peace with God through Jesus Christ our Lord. It says we have peace with God through Jesus. Why? Because the sacrifice of Jesus Christ stood there between men and God, suspended between men and God, to the point that now when God is looking at man, there is Christ at the center. Do you know that song, Jesus at the center? Jesus at the center of you know, he, he was at the center. He was at the center between men and God. Now, when God wants to relate with men, he relates with men through Jesus because the cross of Jesus Christ is hanging right there at the center between men and God. So, this is what I want you to understand that now. So when we're looking at the cross of Jesus Christ being put there in Golgotha on a mountain, people of God, there are pictures. I'm sure if you can Google pictures of the cross of Jesus Christ in Golgotha, you would see like a hill, like a small hill. And on top of the hill, you see a cross and a man, Jesus Christ hanging there with two cross on the sides. So it's like you see Jesus being the center. It's like he's the center between the higher realm and the lower realm. He just stands there as a mediator, mediating for a new and a better covenant by which we are now living by so when we say christ is a mediator of a new covenant we are not just trying to speak good english we are saying yes that's what christ did he represented the center to the extent that when we're looking at the cross from a distance it's like we're seeing the sky we're seeing god who dwells there in the heavenlies and we're seeing the cross jesus and we're seeing the ground which represents the earth it's like we're seeing a man where men live where Christ is at the center and we're seeing where God is to the extent that now it's like when we're looking at the cross, we're seeing God in the skies. We're seeing Christ at the center. We're seeing the earth where men live. So and then if we go to Matthew, let's go to the book of Matthew. Let's go to Matthew, Matthew chapter 27, verse 45, Matthew 27, verse 45, Matthew 27, verse 45. Matthew 27 verse 45. So now I want us to focus on the on Golgotha now as the Christ is hanging on the cross as um as Christ is hanging on the cross. That's what I want us to focus on now. So listen, scripture says when Jesus Christ is hanging up there at the cross, scripture says uh, Matthew 27 verse 45 it says now from the 6th hour there was darkness all over the land unto the ninth hour. So it says from 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 the 6th hour there was darkness all over the land unto the ninth hour. And then verse 46 says, And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice and said, Eli, Eli, lama sabatani, this is to say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So scripture starts by saying, before Jesus Christ says, Eli, Eli, lama sabatani, it says there is darkness all over the earth. So I want you to ask yourself, why do you think there was darkness all over the earth? Jesus Christ is being crucified, but there's, it's like there is darkness all over the earth. So remember, people of God, we, we say the reason why we're talking about atonement, we're saying atonement is our Easter conference. So I want you to have that Easter mood in your mind where we are celebrating Good Friday and on Sunday we are celebrating the resurrection. We were supposed to talk about this during that time, but OK, life happened, but we're here now. So I'm saying Christ is there hanging on the cross and all of a sudden it gets dark. All of a sudden there is just darkness all over the world. So I remember many years ago when I was growing in the Lord, when I would just listen to a lot of sermons, I once heard this is a stolen revelation that changed my life. You can steal it too, people of God, and it will change your life. So this man of God explains and says, when Christ was hanging on the cross there, the sun, listen, that it gets dark. Why does it get dark? Because the sun could not bear to look at God hanging on the cross. The sun could not 
beer to look at God dying. It's like the son is like, yo, I, I have to close my eyes. It's like the son decided, you know what? I'm just going to close my eyes. I can't see God dying at the cross. So it's like, remember, he's the creator. All things were made by him. Without him was nothing made that was made. The son knows its creator. The earth knows its creator. Everything in creation, everything in creation knows its creator. So the son is just looking at God there on the cross. Ah, scripture says there was darkness all over. The son is like, no, like uh, th this, this is my creator. What are they doing to my creator? I, I can't bear to see God in pain. I can't bear to see my Lord in pain like this. So remember what scripture says. Scripture says that when they were arresting Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ says when they were arresting him, when they, are, when they were arresting Jesus Christ, Peter tries to fight and Jesus Christ says, no, why are you trying to fight? Why are you trying to fight? Because, you know, if I want, I could call on God. God could send 12 legions of angels to fight for me. So meaning, people of God, I want to understand that on that day when Christ was dying at the cross, I'm sure if angels get angry or if creatures in the heavenly places or if creation gets angry, I'm sure every form of creation was like to God, God, just give me, just say a word. We'll go kill all of them. We'll go wipe all of them. But God was like, no, relax. This needs to happen. All scripture has to be manifested up until maybe things like the sun. The sun is just like, you know what, Mina, I'm out, guys. Like, I can't look at this. God, if you will not allow us to retaliate, to retaliate, I'll, I'll just close my eyes. So we are, I'm saying this, we are saying this to try and explain why was there darkness? Because God is laying at the cross, but there is darkness all over. And we're saying he's the creator. All things are made by him. Without him, there is nothing made that was made. And all of these things know who their creator is. So... Listen, we're saying the son cannot stand to see the creator. And then we go to uh, verse 46, the next verse. The next verse says, And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabatani. That is to say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So listen, this is Jesus Christ. So I, I've always explained this part of the Bible like this, saying they arrest Jesus Christ, right? After they arrest Jesus Christ, he's checking on the Father. He sees the Father is there with him. The Father is working with him. They take him to Pilate. They ask him questions. They start beating him, beating him. He's, so, he's in so much pain. The Father is there with him. So he's enduring all of this, but knowing that the Father is here with me. They start questioning him. People start scourging him. People start saying, crucify him. He's feeling all this emotional pain, but he looks to his side. The Father is there. He looks to heaven. Heaven is standing there with him. They make him carry a heavy cross. He carries the heavy cross. It's heavy at some point. He looks at the father. The father is still there watching him. They, he walks, he walks until they nail him to the cross. It gets dark. Now, all of a sudden, scripture says, he, he says, my father, my father, why have you forsaken me? It's like now when he's at the cross, because people of God remember, when he was at the cross, when he was hanging at the cross, you know what scripture says happened when Jesus Christ is hanging at the cross? The scripture says that when he was at the cross, when he was at the cross there, he bore our sins. He took our sicknesses. All our sins were on him. So it's like he became the most sinful person in the world because he's getting our sin. Is it because of his sins? No. Okay, maybe let me explain that like this before we go. Yo, okay, now I'm getting excited. When we started the live, I was not excited. <laughs> now I'm so excited. So remember what we said about the lamp of sacrifice. Leviticus chapter 16 says, when the lamp of sacrifice is chosen, the, 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 the duty, another duty of the high priest is that the high priest must lay his hand on the lamp and when he lays his hand on the lamp what must he what must he do he must confess the sins of the nation of israel unto the lamp so that now the lamp is carrying the sins of an entire nation on his on its body so but listen so now when christ is hanging at the cross he's not just carrying the sins of israel when Christ is saying at the cross, it's not the sins of Israel that are heavy on him. It's the sins of all generations. Jesus Christ was carrying the sins of everyone who ever lived in the world and everyone who will ever live in the world. So he was carrying sins of people who would even live 2,000 years later. So he's just standing there and now he's looking at the Father. The Father's not there anymore. It's like, my Father, why have you forsaken me? People of God, I, I, I want you to understand it like this, that God... God does not like sin, right? God does not like sin to the extent that even when Christ was bearing our sins, when Christ looked at the Father, the Father was not there anymore. He looks at the Father, the Father's like, mm-mm. 
And now Christ starts crying to the Father, why have you forsaken me? Why have you forsaken me? It's because he's bearing our sins, he's bearing our sickness, he's bearing everything that God hates. Everything that God does not like, the Christ is carrying it on his body. That's why now when we preach the gospel to people who are lost, we say it doesn't matter what you have done. It doesn't matter what you did. Christ bore all sins on his body. He suffered punishment. You don't have to. He carried all of it in his body so that you don't have to. So there is no sin that God cannot forgive because his son bore all of them. He took all our sins. The sins of the world were on one man, Christ Jesus. That's why Peter says he bore all our sins. So that we who were sinners could now start living a righteous life. It's like the root of sin, the root of every sin. The reason, people of God, listen, the reason why every man sins was in Christ. So now when the Christ looks at the Father, he starts crying, My Father, why have you forsaken me? Because the state that the Christ found himself in at the cross was the state where man was in. God had forsake, God would forsake Israel. There were times where God would forsake Israel. Do you remember, people of God, the story of, uh, what's his name? When we spoke about the story of Gideon. Gideon says to God, God, what happened to the miracles that our forefathers told us about? They told us that you were with them, but look at, look at us now. You have forsaken us. The Midianites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, they come and attack us. We have nothing. We are nothing. God would have forsaken Israel. God would forsake Israel because of their sins. So now when the same thing happens with the Christ, now when he's hanging at the cross, the father's like, mm -mm. <laughs> my son, with this amount of sin that you're carrying, no. And, you know, okay, so listen to what scripture says, just to try and explain what I'm, what I'm trying to say. Um, so Jesus Christ became sin, right? There's a scripture that I want us to read. Um, let's read 2 Corinthians. We are still on Matthew. If you are reading a physical Bible, please don't close Matthew, right? Just remember that thing that we used to do back then. You put one finger on Matthew and then you open other chapters. And then, yeah, when we're done, you just, you just go back to Matthew. So, okay, so... Um, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 21, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 1, verse 21, 2 Corinthians 5 21, this is what it says. It says, for, for our sake, God made him who knew no sin to be made sin, so that we might become the righteousness of God. People of God, I'm going, verse 21, verse 21, verse 21. So listen to the scripture, listen to what the scripture says. Scripture says, for our sake, God made him who knew no sin to be made sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. People of God, I, I don't even have to explain that scripture. Jesus Christ knew no sin, but he became sin. He became sin. He became sin, he who knew no sin. God made him who knew no sin to become sin so that me and you could become the righteousness of God. So can you see that really we have no excuse for a rioter's life. We have no excuse to live in sin because the power to overcome sin is found in Christ and Christ has given us that power. Do you understand? God made him who knew no sin to be made sin so that we could become. So what is the reason why Jesus Christ is carrying sins at the cross? Is it because so that our sins can be forgiven? No. Most of us, you know, most of us normally tell ourselves that, yeah, Jesus died so that God could forgive our sins. Yes, he died so that God could forgive our sins, but it doesn't end there. He also died so that the power of sin can be uprooted from you. He became sin. Do you understand? Scripture doesn't say that he became a sinner. It says he became sin, like he became sin itself, so that me and you could become the righteousness of God. So that me and you could stand as the sons of God. So, but then now, if we if we now t start taking ourselves back to something that God saved us from, do you understand? Like we we want to take ourselves back to a life that Jesus Christ redeemed us from. We want to take ourselves back to a sinful life. Yet God made Him who, like Jesus Christ has already dealt with the sin part in us. If we only we would all believe right. If only we would be prayerful. We would seek for the Lord. We would depend. We would rely. We would trust in and put ourselves wholly unto the things of God. We will see that this sinful life has no part in us. You know we can't live a life that Christ did not live and expect to be free from sin. Do you understand? If we want to be free from sin and we want to see that Christ really did indeed set us free from sin, let's live the life Jesus lived. Seek for God, pray, 
let God be your priority, like number one. Because for us, we, we, we are like, ah, but why does scripture say Jesus Christ set us free from sin, but we still struggle with sin? Are you living the life Jesus lived? Because it's only then that the glory, the manifestation in, in its completeness of what Jesus Christ did for you will manifest. And we've been, spoke, we've been speaking about this for a while now where Paul says, let us go on to perfection. Okay, let's not go there. So Jesus Christ is made sin. God makes Jesus Christ to become sin so that you could be the righteousness. So as he's hanging there at the cross, the reason why... Jesus Christ says, my father, why have you forsaken me? It's because, yes, he's a sinner. He's he has become sin now. He has become sin itself. And the father forsook him at that very moment. He was alone. He found himself alone. Okay, just an extra, right? Though I'm not going to explain this. So after Jesus Christ died at, the, died at the cross, scripture says he went to hell. He went to hell. Jesus Christ died. He goes to hell. Do you want to know why he's going to hell? It's, he's going to hell because that was the punishment that was meant for us. That was the punishment that was meant for you and me. Because of the rioters' life, we are also going to live and Jesus not come. So Jesus Christ bears the sins of the world. He goes to hell for the whole world. So that whosoever believes in him should not have to go through that route. But now a problem comes in 2,000 years later. We don't want to really care about the fact that Jesus did all of these things. We all want to live a life that we're not supposed to be living. And now it's like we, and we, we in our lives, we start undoing the finished work of Christ. Now at the end of the day, people end up having to go to hell for something that Jesus Christ already died for. I feel like when people go to hell, Jesus Christ feels the most pain. Because it's like, I paid the price with my own body. I bore your sins. I carried all your sins. Me and my father have never been separated. But when I carried your sin, me and my father, I had to go to hell for you. But like, look now, you, 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 you are in hell. How? <laughs> How? I'm sure the Lord feels the most pain when a, lo when a soul is lost because he's thinking, I went to hell so that you don't have to. I suffered your sins so that you don't have to. So we're saying Jesus Christ goes to hell. And I'm sure when Jesus Christ went to hell, you know what he went on to do? He went to hell to the point that if hell was expecting any of us, people of God, Jesus Christ went there and cancelled our names. If hell was expecting you, he went there and erased your name. You know, but the problem is when we start living our lives now, we don't care about Christ. We don't care about anything. We don't, we just live a rioter's life and Christ is just there seated, feeling the most pain. Feeling the most pain. People of God, just imagine if you paid for someone's, um, just imagine if you paid for someone's food, you paid for someone's rent, you bought someone a car, you did everything for this person. And one day you see that person at the age of 50, you, you paid for that person's entire life from the moment they were born, you set aside funds to take care of that. You meet that person at the age of 50. They are living in shambles. They don't even have a home. They, are, they, are, they, they look the dirtiest. They, they are the biggest mess you've ever seen. It's like they, they are not anything compared to what you paid for. And you're just sitting there thinking, but I, I paid the price. I, I gave my life so that you don't have to go through this. Like I, I sacrificed myself for you. That's how, that's how God feels. He paid the price. But we, when we start living our lives, we, we, just, we just don't care. Okay, let's not get stuck there. Let's go on. Um, let's go on. Okay, let's just quickly read Galatians chapter 1 verse 4. Galatians chapter 1 verse 4. Just a quick scripture that we're going to read. Uh, listen to what Galatians chapter 1 verse 4 says. Speaking about Jesus Christ, it says, Jesus Christ gave himself for our sins to deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father. It says, Jesus Christ gave himself for our sins to deliver us from this present evil world. Galatians uh, 1 verse 4. Sorry, Ish. Colossians 1 verse 4, 1 verse 4. So Jesus Christ gave himself for our sins to deliver us from this present evil world. So it's like one of the other reasons why Jesus Christ is bearing our sins and dying for us. It's to deliver us from the evil in this world. So that the evil in this world cannot have a grip on us. So that when evil tries to grab us, it can't. 
But these truths only manifest if we seek, if we pursue, if we rely and we depend on him, if we put ourselves wholly unto him. We don't do a half job and we expect scriptures to manifest in us. People of God, we... <laughs> do you know those scriptures that... Do you know those scriptures? Can't you what would Paul says? Uh, yeah, Paul would say scriptures like Galatians chapter 6, is it verse 6 to 9 there? You'd say, uh, do not fool yourselves. God cannot be mocked. It's like Paul would tell people that, don't fool yourselves. Like, don't tell yourself things that are not true. You, we don't trust God when we want and when we feel like, but we still live in sin. We still live a riotous life. We still live our life however we want. But then at the end of the day, we expect that, you know, God, God, people of God. Paul says, do not fool yourselves don't lie to ourselves meaning it's possible for us to lie to ourselves okay let's go on let's go on so i want us now to go back to matthew 27 jesus christ is hanging at the cross jesus christ is hanging at the cross and scripture says that jesus christ says my father my father why have you forsaken me and we're saying at that moment jesus christ was carrying the sins of the world he was even carrying all our sicknesses all our sicknesses were on christ that's why Jesus Christ can heal every sickness. He can heal every disease because he bore all our sicknesses. Do you understand? Even sicknesses that were not yet there, Jesus Christ bore all of them. He carried them all on his body so that you don't have to go through the same, right? Okay, let's read uh, Matthew 27 verse 47. Uh, listen to what scripture says. Matthew 27 verse 47. It says, some of them that stood there when they had him, so it's like some people who were standing there and they had Jesus Christ saying, Eli, Eli, Lama, Sabbatan. Some The scripture says that some of them that stood there when they had him, they said, why is this man calling for Elijah? It's like Jesus, people hear Jesus Christ saying, Eli, Eli, Lama, Sabbatan. And then people are like, it's like people can't hear clearly. They're like, why, why is he calling for Elijah? But what Jesus Christ was basically saying was, my father, my father, why have you forsaken me? And then verse 48 says, and straight away, one of them ran and took a sponge and filled with it with vinegar and put a reed and gave him to drink. And the rest said, uh, let be. Let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. And then verse fifty said, "When Jesus Christ had cried again with a loud voice, he yielded up the ghost." So listen, Scripture says, "When Jesus Christ, when Jesus Christ had cried with a loud voice, listen." <laughs> ah, guys, no colo. I, I, if if our TikTok live was a like a physical change, right? I'd always ask no colo to sit at the back. <laughs> Because of these comments. <laughs> uh, so, 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 look now, no, I don't even know where I was. I don't even know where I was. Where was I? Uh, <laughs> okay, yeah, I, I saw it. Matthew 27, verse 50. Uh, when Jesus cried with a loud voice, he yielded up the ghost. So when Jesus Christ yielded up the ghost, it was then that he died. So, you know, I've, I've ministered on this scripture a lot, but today when I was reading about it, I was like, wow. People of God, listen. The scripture says that Jesus Christ cried with a loud voice. After he cried with a loud voice, he yielded the ghost. Who is the ghost that God, Jesus Christ yielded? The ghost that Jesus Christ yielded was the Holy Spirit. He yielded the Holy Spirit. So other versions say he gave up the ghost. So it's like, who is the ghost? The ghost is the Holy Spirit. So people, I want you to understand this. I want you to understand this. People of God, how do I explain it? Okay, normally when someone dies, right? What do we say when someone dies? We are like, uh, okay, I almost said it in my vernacular language, but it's fine. Let's, 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 let's just say it. So most times we, we say something like, uh, umoya, umoya yeah, we say umoya alseik or something like that, or umoya uko, or something like umoya, umoya is gone, the moya left. Right, speaking of the spirit, right? Uguti, once Umoya, <laughs> once Umoya leaves the body, the body dies. But this is what I want you to understand about Jesus Christ. About Jesus Christ, scripture says Jesus Christ gave up the ghost, he gave up the Holy Spirit. So it's like it's like the life of Jesus Christ was the Holy Spirit. Do you understand? It's like this was Jesus, this was the Holy Spirit. His life was the Holy Spirit like this. To the point where when he gave up the ghost, when he gave up the Holy Spirit, he died. So it's like he was alive through the Holy Spirit. He gave up the ghost. He gave up the Holy... People of God, how do I explain this? His life was the Spirit of God. <laughs> His life was God's Spirit. 
Do you understand? Know Thank you, Samantha. Samantha says he was conceived of the Holy Spirit. Yes, his father was the Spirit, and the, 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 his father was the Holy Spirit, and his father was his life. To the point that now when he yielded up the ghost, he, he, there is no life in him anymore. There is no life in the body anymore. Why? Because his life is the Holy Spirit. His, people of God, these are things that we should pursue. Pursue this life. Pursue this life where you are so one with God that your life is the Spirit of God. That there is no differentiation between your spirit and God's spirit. Actually, there is a scripture. Is it First Corinthians chapter 6? Okay, somewhere around there. Verse 19, verse 20, I'm not sure. It says that he that is joined with the Lord is one spirit with him. He that is joined with the Lord is one spirit with him. So Jesus Christ was a complete manifestation of that scripture. He was one spirit. He, his spirit was the Holy Spirit. When he gave up the ghost, he just, he just died. So his life was the spirit. His life was in the spirit. His life is spirit his life was spirit he was just spirit and spirit so when he gives up the ghost there is no life in him found anymore and then and then and then and then and then and then um okay let's go on should should we talk about this I, okay, no, let's let's skip this, otherwise we won't finish. Let's focus on Matthew. So, okay, Matthew 27, verse 51. Matthew 27, verse 51. Are we there? Matthew 27, verse 51. Are you guys there? As you're opening your Bibles, the pastor will take a break. Uh, are we there? Matthew 27, verse 51. Listen, oh, okay, now we just got to another fire-packed part of the Bible. Matthew 27, 51, so Jesus Christ says, just yielded the ghost, right? So he had just yielded the ghost, and when he yielded the ghost, he died. And then listen to what happened right after Jesus Christ dies. Right, the moment he gives up his uh, last breath, listen to what scripture says. It says, behold, the veil of the temple was rent into two from the bottom um, to the top. And the earth did quake and the rocks did rent. So it's like, listen, yo, I don't know how to illustrate this. Shem. Hey, this is going to be fun to illustrate. So listen, this is God hanging, at the, hanging on the cross. We're saying all creation knows who is hanging at the cross. All creation knows that, okay, God is about to die. The maker is about to die at the cross. Why, why is he dying? Like, it's like, it's like the moment he dies at the cross, people of God, the scripture says the earth shook. People of God, I want to ask you a question. Um, do, do you remember that time when we were kids, when your mom would slap you? When your mom would slap you, how do how do kids cry? Kids throw themselves on the ground, right? We throw ourselves on the ground. We just start doing all funny things, all funny things. So now the scriptures tell us about the earth, that the earth's reaction to the death of Christ. It, it just shook. It was like the earth was just like, ah, do you understand? It's like the earth, it's like the earth can't believe. Did he just die? Did God just die at the cross? The earth is just shaking and shaking and shaking and shaking. Scripture also tells us that the rocks, the rocks, tore themselves apart they ripped themselves apart rocks rocks that had stood from creation when christ dies at the cross they just wrap themselves apart they just tear themselves apart the earth on the other side is just shaking and shaking and shaking and shaking and shaking this is a good illustration <laughs> so yeah the rocks were splitting the rocks split themselves into two it's like have you ever seen those kids with tantrums people of god Kids with, especially this, this kids these days, all of them have tantrums. Yeah. You slap them here, they throw themselves to the ground. They just want to break themselves into pieces. Some even head to the hole, like, boom, boom, on the hole. They just throw themselves down. So it's like those rocks were like that on that day. They just tore themselves apart. They just rent. The earth is shaking. The rocks are renting. People of God. So it's like this is creation looking at the Mecca dying at the cross. And they are just like, no. Right? So, but the... The most important part that I want you to uh, that I want us to talk about uh, now is the fact that Scripture says when Jesus Christ died at the cross, the veil tore apart. It says the veil in the temple tore apart. So we spoke about this, but we didn't talk about it in detail, right? Uh, we spoke about this, but we didn't speak about it in detail, and. Um, I'm going to explain it now. Why does scripture tell us about a veil that tore apart? So listen. So in the old covenant, right, there was a, we spoke about the outer court. 
okay, I, I remember giving you this example on uh, on Tuesday. So like, imagine your yard, right? Imagine your yard, your wall, your jura wall, or maybe a fence, right? Mm. So, and then, and then there's a house, right? And then inside the house, there were two rooms. And the two rooms were divided by a veil. So it's like, uh, that veil was separating the most holy place and the holy place. So it's like any priest could minister in the holy place, but only the high, high priest once a year can go into beyond the veil, on the other side of the veil. Only the high priest can do that once a year. So what was in the most holy place on the other side of the veil was the Ark of the Covenant. It was the presence of God. It was where God was found. God in his manifested form dwelt there. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. So God was hidden by that veil. So it's like from creation and uh, no, actually not from creation. From the time God gave Moses the law and told them to create the ark and everything. From the beginning of that moment, of that time, God was hidden by that veil. That veil was hiding God from mankind. So when Jesus Christ dies, scripture says that the veil, it was torn apart. Did anyone tear the veil apart? No. The veil was torn apart. Why? Because Jesus Christ is, was ending that entire system. That no, God shall no longer be found here. God shall no longer be found in, on the other side of the veil. Jesus Christ had told his disciples, right? Jesus Christ had told his disciples that no, on that day, you shall know that I and my father are one and I am in you. So he had told them these things that no, they shall come a time where true worshippers shall worship in spirit and in truth. They won't need to go to a mountain or to go to Jerusalem where the ark is. They won't need to go anywhere. As long as they are in spirit and in truth, God will be in them. So Jesus Christ, when Jesus Christ dies at the cross, God tears the veil to, to show us that no, now there is no more separation. Now we all have access into the most holy place. So people of God, I want, you to, I want you to imagine it like this. It's like when Jesus Christ died at the cross there and the veil was torn apart, if there were priests on that day that were ministering at the temple, priests who had never, ever seen what was beyond the veil, on that day they saw beyond the veil. I'm sure people thought that, yo, we are going to die. We are, are going to die. And maybe the priest thought, yo, we have seen the most holy place. We are going to die. But no, that covenant was done with. The veil was torn apart to mark the beginning of a new covenant. To say that, no, now the covenant that God has with, with men, it's a personal relationship. Now God won't dwell in a box. Now God dwells in men. He now lives in you. Do you understand? Okay. So, um, <clears throat> so, so we're saying the veil that hid the glory of God is just torn apart. And then the death of Christ just opens it up. And then, um, so it's like God gets to a point where he's trying to, sp to relate to this thing to men that, no, I've always had standards to the fact that no one can encounter me except a high priest after he has cleansed himself. But that was because of the fall of Adam. After Adam fell, men had this sinful nature that God could not stand. And th the blood of gods and bulls could not uproot so because of that, as long as man has that sinful nature, God says to himself that I, I will be hidden from man. But once, once Christ dies at the cross, God just is like, no, now I want to be known. Now I want to be revealed. Why? Because God knew that through Christ, now man will meet his standard through Christ. Through Christ, God knew that now I will live in man. Because why is God telling himself that now through Christ things will change? Now I won't be hidden in a box. Now I won't be seen once a year. Now no high priest will come here once a year. Now God is just like, I want to come out. I want to come out of this box. I want to live in them and I want to be one with them. Do you understand? So something that stood for generations at the death of Christ, it was just ripped to mark a new covenant, to mark a new dispensation, to say that no, now those who worship in spirit and in truth, they will find God. Do you understand? Um, so I want us, I want us, I want us to, as we are still there, I want us to listen. Let's go to the book of Revelation. I want us to explain this veil thing. I want us to explain the veil in a broader way. Revelation chapter four, verse one. Uh, Revelation chapter four, verse one.
Revelation chapter 4 verse 1 Are we there people of God? <clears throat> Revelation chapter 4 verse 1 um, So I want to link Revelation chapter 4 verse 1 To what happened at the temple Right? So listen, Revelation chapter 4 verse 1 This is John John says, After this I looked And behold, a door standing open in heaven And the first voice which I heard was as a voice speaking unto me, which said, come up here, I will show you what will happen after this. So listen, people of God. This is, this is, a, this, this is one of my favorite revelations. Like, ish. my favorite revelation. Listen to what scripture says. Scripture says this is after the death of Jesus Christ. Because remember, when you go to Revelation chapter 1 verse 1, Revelation chapter 1 verse 1 starts by saying, this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Other version says, Revelation chapter 1, verse 1, this is the unveiling of Jesus Christ. Too bad I don't have anything to use to unveil. But it's like what scripture is basically trying to tell us is that from generations past, the mystery of Christ was always hidden. The reason why Christ came, it was always, though it was known, but it was hidden. But when we come to the book of Revelation, Revelation calls it the unveiling. It's like for generations past, Christ was hidden like this. But when the book of Revelation comes, Christ is unveiled. Now Christ can be known, right? Now people can know Christ and walk with him, right? So when we come to Revelation chapter 4, verse 1, Revelation chapter 4, verse 1 says, John says, a door stood open in heaven. And I'm saying, note this, that this door stood open in heaven after Jesus died. After the death of Jesus Christ, all of a sudden, now a door is standing open in heaven. And John says, as the door stood open in heaven, I heard a voice. A voice said, come up here. I want to show you. Now, this is God inviting man. She was saying, now this is God looking for men to say, you know what? I've always had heaven. No one has ever seen it. No one has ever been here. But now I want to show you. Come, 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 come up here. John says, the voice said, come up here. I want to show you. I, this is God. Listen, this, this, just imagine you standing as John on that day. God comes to you and says, come. I, I want to show you. I want you to see. People of God, these are scriptures that I used to pray a lot when I was trusting God to open my spiritual eyes. I would quote these scriptures saying, Lord, according to the book of Revelation chapter 4 verse 1, John says he saw a door that stood open in heaven and you said to John, John, come up here. I want to show you. Lord, I know that John in the book of Revelation stood for every believer in the New Testament church. John stood for every believer in the New Testament church. He stood for every believer in the New Testament church and you calling John to come and see. It says that you're calling us, Lord. You want us to see. You want us to experience have it lord i'm trusting you so listen i want to say this listen to the other thing that i want you i want you to understand what i want you to understand is that as long as there was a veil in the temple in israel that door was closed but the moment the veil is torn apart in israel the moment the veil is torn apart in israel a door opens in heaven because now god does not want to hide from men anymore god wants to be seen he wants to be known God now wants to be seen. The veil is torn apart. Now everyone can see what was holy. Now everyone can see what was hidden. Now everyone can see what could only be seen once a year. And this is now God coming to John saying, come up here. I want to show you. Come, 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 come. People of God, I want you to imagine this. People of God, do you know, do you know what I do? Something that I used to do back then, like way back. Normally when I would pray back then and even when I pray now, I imagine things. I, 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 I want to engage my mind. I, I, I try to engage my mind. And I know that the more I engage my mind, one day my spirit will connect with that and a vision will just open one night i'll just wake up and be like you yesterday i was in heaven yesterday i remember in january was it january or late december uh, i think it was early january maybe one january two january there all of a sudden boom i see myself in heaven I'm just like eh. and then i'm just looking at seeing heaven and i'm seeing like angels are just walking like this is like normal really okay it's normal for them they live there but i'm just seeing angels just walking around some are walking in pairs they're even talking you know people of god have you ever stood in a market in a market and you see people walking some are talking some are doing this and i'm just like eh, is this, this is heaven and i look up i see some angels flying on the on the on the skies there some angels are standing on the roof and, and i'm just like eh. so 
listen, the reason I'm saying all of this is because a door was open when Christ died at the cross. And when the door opened, there is a voice. The voice says, come up here. People of God, I want you to imagine the voice like this. Imagine the voice of God speaking to you like, come up here. Come. No, Tolo, come up here. <laughs> I want to show you. Dalito, Bangoro, come up here. Kilebuhile, come up here. <laughs> I want to show you. Come up here. Kahi, come. Ji, come. Come up here. <laughs> so that's what God is saying to you. God is calling you. Do you understand? People of God, I, when I read my Bible, when I see a New Testament character, a New Testament saint receiving something from God, I know that he stood there for me too. He stood for the church. Do you understand? He stood for the church. That voice is the same voice speaking to you. Come up here. I want to show you what will happen after this. So, ish, okay, let's not try and explain that because we will not get to the end of uh, what I want us to what I wanted to talk about. Okay, but maybe, maybe let me just throw in extra. What's our time? Oh, our time, is, our time is moving. So listen, the voice said, I want to show you what will happen after this. So listen, just by reading that scripture, you can already see that God wants us to be ahead. God wants you to know what will happen after this, before it happens. God wants you to know. God wants you ahead. He wants you to know. He wants you understanding things that have not happened yet. Because we follow God, his spirit dwells in us. God knows time, he understands time. He says to John, I want to show you things that have not happened. Okay, let's not explain that. Listen, Revelation chapter 4 verse 2. So we are saying all of this is happening because Jesus Christ has died. Because Jesus Christ's death tears the veil at the temple uh, to reveal God who was hidden from generations. Uh, is TikTok, what is TikTok doing? Okay, there was something on my screen, message from TikTok. So, 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 listen. Um, the veil has been torn. The veil has been ripped apart. The veil was not ripped apart for fun, people of God. The veil was ripped so that you can see what was not seen. So that you can know what was not known. So that you can know what has not happened. So that you can see what has not happened yet. The voice says to you, come up here want to show you so john says revelation chapter 4 verse 2 listen john says revelation chapter 4 verse 2 he says listen once the voice said to john come up here i want to show you once the voice said to john come up here i want to show you john says in revelation chapter 4 verse 2 in an instant immediately i was in the spirit says in an instant i was in the spirit and listen john says behold a throne stood open in heaven and one was seated on the throne People of God, okay, let me ask you this question. Um, do you know that Jesus Christ, before Jesus Christ died, do you know that before Jesus Christ died, no one had been to heaven? No one knew heaven before Christ died. Did you guys know that? Before Christ dies, no one has idea of what heaven is like. Uh, before the death of Christ, no one knows, right? So I want us to read this scripture. I want us to read this scripture. Uh... No one has been to heaven. So let's open John chapter 3. Let's open. Let's open John chapter 3 verse 13. John chapter 3 verse 13. As you open a break. Okay, John chapter 3 verse 13. What does John chapter 3 verse 13 say? This was during the days when Jesus was in the flesh, before he died. He says to them, No one has gone into heaven except the Son of Man, who is from heaven. Tells them in John chapter 3 that no one has been to heaven, no, it's only me. <laughs> That's what he says to them. He says, no man has been to heaven, it's only me. So, this is what I mean by saying that when Jesus Christ died at the cross, right? He, he, he opened the door. So now all of a sudden, John finds himself in heaven. John finds himself in heaven all of a sudden. No man has been to heaven, but John finds himself in heaven. Why? Because the veil has been ripped. A door has been opened in the spirit. So I want to say to you, people of God, that there is a door. To the realm of the spirit there is a door to heaven 
and maybe someone might be asking, how do I, how do I access those things? We pray with these scriptures. You take the scriptures, turn them into a prayer. Turn them into a prayer. Turn them into a prayer somehow. This is how I pray. I go, I look for scripture. I turn scriptures into prayer. Do you understand? I turn scriptures into prayer. I say to the Lord, Lord, a door stands open in heaven. Jesus Christ died at the cross and the veil was ripped. Now I have access to. Ah, guys. So listen, John says, I was in the spirit and a throne stood open in heaven and one was seated on the throne. So who is seated at the throne? God is seated at the throne. And all of a sudden, now people have access into heaven and they can see one who's sitting on the throne. I remember I remember I posted a, a video. What video did I post? I, I remember I posted a video and when I posted a video, I'm like, um, I saw the father. I saw the father and though I saw his back and he was walking and the son, oh, it was on the podcast. The son was walking behind the father and the spirit was also uh, walking it was the father the son and the spirit and they called me to walk with them and i started walking with them and i saw a comment someone saying ah i don't believe anyone can can see god i'm like okay i'm not saying i saw the face of god i've had i think i've had about three encounters with the father i've never seen his face i've seen his form i've seen his shape and when we come to the book of revelation here john tells us that he saw god sitting on the throne do you understand? So he says he saw God sitting on. He says I saw one sitting on the throne. Do you understand? So people take it from all the way back to Moses, uh, where God says you can't see God and live. You see me, you die. Um, it was because man during that time was full of sin. Man had this nature that God could not stand. Do you understand? But now we are purified. We are washed by the blood of Jesus Christ. What applied to Moses? does not apply to me. Moses was not washed by the blood. I'm washed by the blood. Remember that scripture where we looked at scriptures where Jesus Christ is speaking about Abraham, where Jesus Christ is telling the, the people back then that he is greater than Abraham. And the people are like, you, how are you saying you are greater than Abraham? You are not even 50 years old. Abraham lived hundreds of years ago and he was great. And do you know what Jesus Christ said to them? Jesus Christ said, hey, hey, hey. Abraham saw my day and he rejoiced. Abraham was waiting for me to be manifested in the flesh. And when he saw me coming into the world, being born of a woman, Abraham rejoiced. And they wanted to kill Jesus for that. It's because these are people with little understanding. They themselves thought Abraham is greater than Jesus because Christ is not revealed to them. Do you understand? So I'm trying to say this, that people of God, we are living in a different time. We are living in a different dif dispensation. Remember that scripture that we also read, John, First John, is it? First Peter chapter 1, verse 10 to 12, where the scripture says that uh, this grace that you are living in, the prophets prophesied about it. And when the spirit was showing them this salvation that you have received, they started searching what manner of time the spirit in which was in them did signify when it spoke about the suffering of Christ. But the Holy Spirit revealed to the prophets back then, to Moses, Elijah, uh, Jeremiah, Isaiah, Ezekiel, the spirit revealed to them that salvation being saved where God lived in a man was not for them they could not have access to salvation because uh, the only people who have access to salvation are people who live after christ has died those are the ones that god lives in them he lives in us he didn't live in them because it was not possible because of the of the of the dispensation they lived in they lived in the dispensation of adam where all men were sinners not because they wanted to sin but because there was no christ to come and free men from the root of sin so we are saying Jesus Christ dies and all of a sudden John has access into heaven. Now man has access into places where no man has ever been to. Do you understand? Okay, I don't want to take too much time explaining this because there is uh, something else that I want us to talk about. So John says that uh, he sees a throne in heaven and he that sat on the throne. Listen, he says he that sat on the throne had the appearance. People of God, should we talk about this? No, okay, it's fine. We'll talk about this one day when maybe we talk about the realm of the spirit. Let's leave this right. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 8 because I have a feeling now we'll end up deviating from uh, Christ hanging at the cross and all of these things. We'll talk about Revelation chapter 4, the, if the Lord will allow one day when we talk about the, the realm of the spirit. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 4, Hebrews chapter 8, Hebrews chapter 8. Hmm...
Hebrews chapter 8 verse 1 are we there Hebrews chapter 8 am I <laughs> Hebrews chapter 8 verse 1 so Hebrews chapter 8 verse 1 um, listen to what Hebrews chapter 8 verse 1 says it says now of the things we have spoken this is the sum so it's like Paul says out of everything I've said he's been teaching them Hebrews chapter 6 Hebrews chapter 7 Hebrews chapter 8 now he says now of everything I've been saying this is the sum listen he says of everything I've said this is the summary we have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of God in majesty in the heavens. So the reason why Paul is telling them that we have a different high priest is because those people during those days, they knew a physical high priest. Do you remember that man who tried to look for people to lie about Jesus? That man was a high priest. So these people are familiar with the high priest who is a man who lies like death who tries to look for false witnesses to lie about someone because he wants them to die. So now Paul wants to teach them something new. He says, you know what? We have a high priest. And our high priest is seated on the, on the right hand of the throne in majesty in the heavens. Our The high priest that we have is not like that man. <laughs> uh, let's give the high priest a name during those days. Let's say maybe the high priest during that days was Mr. Maben. Paul is saying to them, we have a high priest in heaven, not Mr. Mabena. <laughs> Mr. Mabena is the high priest here. And Jesus has ended that thing. But Mr. Mabena and his friends, they are still going on. But now God has gave us a new high priest who is seated in heaven. That's what Paul is trying to say. <laughs> that no, forget about Mr. Mabena. We have a new high priest who is in heaven, who is seated at the right hand. And then listen to what he says in uh, Revelation chapter 8, verse 2. He says, uh, the high priest that we have is a minister of the sanctuary of the true tabernacle with which the Lord pitched, not man. He says, the high priest, Jesus Christ, that we have, when Christ became our high priest, he says, Jesus Christ is seated at a temple which was made by God, not man. Mr. Mabena is sitting in a temple which he hired those guys to build. But now the high priest that we have is sitting on a temple that was built by God in heaven. That's what Paul is trying. Okay, we'll talk about these things in detail um, if we happen to proceed about this. But for now, I'm reading this so that I can get to a verse that I want. So... And then we jump to verse 5. When we jump to verse 5, he says, Hebrews, people of God, let me tell you a story. Yo, yo, yo. I just remember this story. I remember this one story. I went to this other church that my sister used to go to. Yo, ah, my sister, guys. Uh, my sister used to go. <laughs> my sister used to go to this other church and they invited me one day. Uh, and me being me, like, when I've always want, loved knowing the word of God because I don't want people to come and lie to me and rob me. So I go to that church. Now, there was a prophet from America. The prophet from America comes and he starts preaching. And when the prophet from America preaches, he reads a, a Hebrews uh, chapter 8, verse 3. Is it Hebrews chapter 8, verse 3? And he starts telling us that, yeah, now he is the high priest. He is the high priest of the house. He, he, he is the one who takes people's things. I'm like, ha, huh? <laughs> Mr. Mabena lost his job when Jesus died 2,000 years ago. And now you want to tell us that you are now re removing Jesus and putting yourself as a high priest. No. Hebrews chapter 8 verse 1 says, We have a high priest who is sitting in heaven. He sits on a temple that is not made with the hands of man. God built that temple. So who are you? <laughs> That's why I noticed. I was so young during that time, but I noticed that at times our pastors don't read the Bible, eh? Hey? <laughs> Times our pastors don't read the Bible. They just come and they just come and lie to our mothers and our sisters and our sisters and say, Amen. Amen. I, <laughs> I remember after that day I get home. I try to reason with my sister. I'm like, no, but the Bible says Jesus is the high priest. She's like, hi, hi. The pastor, the pastor is right. Hi, hi. She's just fighting. <laughs> I'm like, how can a man come and say he's a high priest when the Bible says Jesus is our high priest? So I'm just like, people of God, we must know so that we are not deceived and lied to, right? Okay, let's go on. So Hebrews chapter 8 verse 5 says, um, um, 
So Hebrews chapter 8 verse 5, this is Paul now trying to explain to us the difference between our high priest Jesus Christ and this these Mabenas out there, right? He says, we have a high priest, or he says, this high priest that we have, we are an example of the shadow of the heavenly things. As Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle, God said, see that you make according to the pattern which I've showed thee in the mount. So listen, listen. <clears throat> so what Paul is trying to tell us is that the sacrificial system, Hebrews, I'm trying to explain Hebrews chapter 8 verse 5, where Paul says the, the Mabenas and, and his friends, right? Aaron and his friends, right? Um, they, what they were doing, Paul says, Hebrews chapter 8 verse 5, it was an example, a shadow of the heavenly things. It was a shadow of the heavenly things. As Moses was told by God the day he built the ark, that Moses built the Ark of the Covenant, according to what I showed you in the mountain. So it means before Moses built the Ark of the Covenant, the most holy place and the holy place, Moses was caught up. God showed him in the spirit how the temple in heaven is like. And God told Moses, Moses, go and build according to what I showed you. But what you have is just a copy of what is in heaven. When the real high priest Jesus Christ comes, I will dismantle your example because the image Jesus Christ would have come. So it's like Moses had a, a shadow. I always like to explain and say, it's like Moses had a picture of something. Moses had a picture of a car. Do you understand? Moses had a picture of a car. The car was going to come 2,000 years later. So now when the car comes 2,000 years later, God is like, people of God, let me ask you this question. If, okay, let me, yeah, good example. Um, normally when, when I maybe say go to buy something that I saw online, I like to take a picture, right? Take a picture and I go to game and I get to game and I'm like, okay, I saw this thing. Uh, where do you think I can find it? So it's like, I have an image of that thing. I don't have it yet. I don't even know that thing, but I, I have an image. I have a picture and I show the guys who work at game and I'm like, I'm looking for this thing. Then the guy at game is like, oh, come, let me show you. And then he comes and takes me there. You know, the moment he takes me to that thing, I put my phone in my pocket. I don't need that picture anymore, guys. I'll even delete it. I don't need it anymore. So that's what Christ did with the old covenant. It was a shadow. It was an Im it was like not the, the real image. It was a shadow of him. So when now he came, guys, God did not need copies. God did not need a copy when the real image had now been manifested. So so I'm saying, people of God, what Christ accomplished at the cross was to open the door to the realities of God so that we are no longer under a shadow, but we are now seeing the very image of things. Do you understand? Okay, so... Um, okay, let's go back to Matthew. Yo, if we continue with Hebrews here, we'll not finish talking about Matthew. Let's go to Matthew 27, 52. Jesus is hanging at the cross. Yo, okay, guys, we're about to conclude the live, right? Uh, Jesus, I just want us to finish... Um, this thing so that when we start we won't have to go back to matthew 27 matthew 27 matthew 27 so jesus christ is walking into a temple that is not made with hands he is not that high priest uh like the high priest that we have now but jesus christ is this high priest who's sitting in the heavenlies right so matthew 27 matthew 27 uh verse 52 matthew 27 verse 52 matthew 27 verse 52 so Matthew 27 verse 51 already told us that when Jesus Christ died, the veil of the, at the temple was rent, the earth did quake, and the, and the, the rocks rent. It's like the, the rocks split. And listen, scripture says Matthew 27 verse 52, it said when Jesus died at the cross, the graves were open. It says graves were open and many bodies of the saints which slept um, came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many. People of God, have you ever paused to think about Matthew 26, verse 52 and 53? It said no one preaches about this. No one talks about this. No one is even interested in even hinting about this. But scripture says when Jesus died, people resurrected from the dead. Those that who died came back to life. <laughs> 
scripture says the graves were open and many bodies of the saints which slept arose And they came out of their graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. And, okay, what I like about this scripture, this scripture says, um, the people that rose on that day, it says it was the bodies of the saints. So who are the saints? The saints are those who lived for the Lord. The saints are those people who lived for... But because, remember, remember what we say, before Jesus Christ dies... No one can ascend to heaven. No one can ascend to heaven before Jesus Christ dies. Why? Because God lives in heaven. Remember that what that scripture says. Scripture, scripture, scripture says that. Um, scripture says that um, our Father who art in heaven. Our Father who art in heaven. So before, before Jesus Christ dies, no one can ascend to heaven because God is in heaven. And the only way to God is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ says, I, I am the way, my friends. I am the truth, I am the life. No man can go to the Father except through me. No man can go to the Father except through me. So if God is in heaven, no man can go to God in heaven because Jesus has not died. So now scripture tells us that when the the when Jesus Christ dies at the cross the 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 tombs open and the saints who had died they resurrect. I want to ask you this I want to tell you this thing. So the reason why the saints have to resurrect and take their bodies is because that's how Jesus Christ was to resurrect to. People of God when Jesus Christ resurrected, he didn't resurrect and take a spirit and left his body. Do you understand? When Jesus Christ resurrected, he resurrected with his body, right? So, scriptures tell us that now when 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 Jesus Christ died, graves were open and it says many bodies of the saints. I heard someone saying spirit bodies or fleshly. Um it, it's not talking about spirits here. It's talking about uh uh Many bodies of the of the saints are uh, coming up, and Scripture says that they came out of their graves. People of God, spirits are not in graves, right? Can we agree on the fact that spirits are not in graves, but bodies are in graves? When someone dies, the spirit goes, right? The body is left there. But when Jesus when Jesus died, the spirits came back to the bodies. Those people came back to life again. It says, "Many saints which slept rose." Because Jesus Christ, you remember, who remembers what Jesus Christ said when they asked him, would he, um, um, Lazarus is dead and now it's been three days. If only you had come early. People of God, who, 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 <laughs> people of God, who remembers the answer that Jesus Christ gave them? Who, who remembers the answer that Jesus Christ gave them when they said Lazarus is dead yeah, and all of that? Jesus Christ said, I am the resurrection and I am the life. Says me. Let me, let me speak about this in, in broken English that we used to use when we were kids. Jesus Christ said, is me, is me, is resurrection. There is no resurrection that comes from some way. Do you understand? Jesus Christ wants them to, to understand that um, um, there is no resurrection that will come from somewhere. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and I am the life. Do you understand? So scripture says that, okay, okay, I see people, <laughs> I see people debating about this spirit body, fleshly body, spirit bodily. Okay, first of all, when Jesus Christ resurrected, he resurrected with his fleshly body, Right? When Jesus resurrected, he resurrected with his fleshly body. And then when, when Jesus Christ resurrected, he appeared to his disciples. And his disciples, uh, when the disciples first saw Jesus Christ, you know what they say? They say to themselves, yo, is this a ghost? Is this a spirit? You know what Jesus Christ said to them when they were thinking he's a spirit? He was like, do spirits have flesh and bones? It's like, feel, I have flesh, I have bones. Do spirits have flesh and bones? It's like, I'm... Um, this is my flesh. He even shows them, this is where they pierced me. Here, 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 here. And scripture says that they were eating and he took the fish and he ate the fish with them. Just to try and show them that I resurrected in my body. So what I want you to understand, people of God, is that the death of Christ, the reason why the, the, the bodies, the, the many saints which slept 
rise up again. It's because God was marking this in the realm of the spirit, that life has begun, that the death of this one brings life to those who have been waiting. Remember, when Jesus Christ is dying at the cross and he sees that other thief who was next to him, the thief next to him, uh, Jesus, what did Jesus Christ promise the other thief? He said, I'll meet you where? He said, I'll meet you in paradise, right? Did he say heaven? He's like, no, I can't, I, no, not heaven, but in paradise. Because paradise was like a waiting area until Christ could come and open up the doors of heaven. Of heaven. So until Christ dies and opens up the doors of heaven, you, you have to wait in paradise. Do you understand? So when Jesus Christ dies, God wants to use the death of Jesus Christ to mark the beginning of life. So scripture says saints who, 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 who died in the old, uh, ah, listen to what Mangoro is asking, where their bodies not decayed. Lazarus' body was decayed, but he came back. The we are uh, people of God. Jesus Christ's body too, after three. People go, we are talking about God. We are not talking about science and our understanding of how things work. Do you understand? We are not talking about how things work, that okay, if someone has been dead for how many days it's born. Here we are talking about God. Do you understand? We God is God. God is, is God. Scripture says that what is impossible with man, with God, it's possible. Meaning, Scripture says God can do exceeding abundantly above how much more than you could ask or think. So meaning God is not limited to what we think. My thoughts are nothing compared to what God can do. Do you understand? So, Scripture... <laughs> Okay, let's leave this. We'll explain it one day, right? We'll explain it one day when we talk about um, the resurrection, right? For now, I want you guys to have this Easter message, right? Uh, what's our time? Yo! Ah, uh, guys. Ah, uh, guys. What should we do? <laughs> our time is gone. 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 So... Um, the, 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 the bodies of the old of the old saints are seen. It's like they appeared unto many in the cities. Um, I've, I've, I've heard some people say it's like the, they appeared unto people for a period of 40 days. Um, uh, it's like they appeared unto people for a period of 40 days. And it's like, I, I want to give these examples. It's like, uh, it's like when the saints of old, when the saints of old were slept, came out of their grave just imagine maybe maybe david was seen walking in the city of david maybe solomon was seen maybe isaiah was also seen saying i did prophesy that the this christ will come a virgin shall bear forth the child and the child shall become the savior of the world maybe when their bodies were given life again and they were seen for that for that period maybe they were proclaiming the message saying these are things that we prophesied these are things that we preached these are things that we told the people but the scripture says yes they did come out of their graves and they appeared unto many so we're saying the death of christ at the cross it was a complete um, um fulfillment of the mosaic law to 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 bring an end to the mosaic law to bring a new dispensation through christ that's why first jo not first john john chapter one is it john chapter one verse 16 17 there would say that the law listen the law came by moses but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. The law came by Moses, but grace came by Christ. Those are two different covenants. Moses brought the law, Jesus Christ brought grace. Remember, we spoke about the transfiguration on the other life, where we spoke about Elijah, who, who represented the prophets. We spoke about Moses, who represented the law. We are now speaking about Jesus Christ, who represented a covenant that God established with men, which is based on his death and resurrection, of which it's called the great... That's why now Paul says... Um, 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 is what's that scripture? Ephesians chapter two, verse four. Is it? Okay, I'm not sure. But that scripture, what's that scripture? It says, "For by grace are you saved through faith." Right. So, okay, let me just search for that scripture. By grace are ye saved. Okay, Ephesians chapter 2, verse uh, 8, it says, For by grace are you saved through faith. Why? Because the law came by Moses, but Jesus Christ brought grace. So we are saved by what Christ brought. We are saved by the grace of God that Jesus Christ brought. We are not saved by the Mosaic law. We are saved by the grace of God. For by grace are you saved through faith, right? So um, we are saying the death of Christ had to be like that to accomplish all the requirements of the Mosaic law. That's why also in the trans 
Transfiguration, we explained this on the other live, that God brings Moses and Elijah and he tells Moses representing the law, he tells Elijah representing the prophets, he says to them, this is my son. Now it's time for you, Moses and your law, Elijah and your prophets to listen to my son. At the Transfiguration, God explains to the law, he explains to the prophets, says now, listen to my son. My son has brought a new dispensation. People shall no longer depend on the law of Moses. They shall no longer depend on the prophets. Now they shall depend on my son. Salvation is now through my son, Jesus Christ. Do you understand? Um, okay, so, um, okay, let's conclude by reading. Um, how do we conclude this? Okay, let's conclude by going to... Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. This is where we're going to end, right? Um, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse, verse 17. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 17. Are we there? Okay. So Paul then uh, comes to conclude in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. He says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, and all things are passed away, and behold, all things are become new. So Paul now explains, because like he has just, I'm sure Paul had just taught all of these people about how Christ accomplished the, the sacrificial system of Moses, and he became the sacrifice. He became the sacrifice. So he became the sacrifice to open up a new way, a new way of trusting God, a new way of working with God, a new way of accessing God. Now we access God through him. So now that's why he concludes then and says, so now if any man is in Christ, he's a new creature, all things are passed away and all things have become new. Okay, I don't want to explain the scripture today. And I want to start from... Uh, the scripture that I want is verse 18. Listen to what verse 18 says. Verse 18 says, And all things are of God, who has reconciled us by himself through Jesus Christ, and he has given us the ministry of reconciliation. He says, All things are of God. He says, All things are of God, who has reconciled us unto himself through Jesus Christ. I explained this when I was talking about the cross, that the hill of Golgotha is like this, right? The, the, the cross of Jesus Christ stands in between the ground and God. It stands in between God and the atmosphere where God is. So Jesus Christ stands at the center between the earth and God. He, and now when we come to Romans, uh, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18 says, Yes, God reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. God fixed what was the problem between us and himself by Jesus Christ. And Paul says, and God has given us that same ministry of reconciliation. So it's like but Jesus Christ was the one that God used to fix things. And Paul says, now God has also given us that same ministry of reconciliation. Now it is us. Now it is us who have to... Um, take that same message that was in Jesus Christ to now it's our duty to go around reconciling people, telling people that they are reconciled with God through Jesus Christ, right? When Jesus Christ was in the flesh and when Jesus Christ died, God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself through Jesus Christ. And now what God has done, since Christ is not here in the flesh anymore, God has given us that same ministry of reconciliation. Now it's our duty to go around telling people about this ministry of reconciliation, right? That's why Paul says in, in verse 20, he says, So now therefore we are, ambassador, we are ambassadors of Christ. Why? Because now we carry the ministry of reconciliation. Now we are ambassadors of Christ. We now represent Christ on the earth. Right, but now I want us to read Second uh, Corinthians chapter five, verse nineteen. But let me just read verse eighteen, and we go to verse nineteen. It says, "All things are of God, who has reconciled us to Himself by Jesus Christ, and He has given us the ministry of reconciliation." And listen, listen. Verse nineteen is one of my favorite old time scriptures. It says that uh, that. God was in Christ. Listen, people of God, pay attention. Pay, pay, pay attention to this. Pay attention to verse 19. It says, God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not counting people's sins against them, but instead canceling them. Do you understand? God was in Christ no longer counting people's sins against them, but instead canceling them. And he has 
committed unto us that same ministry of reconciliation. So God was in Christ and he was just canceling people's sins against them. So when Jesus Christ dies at the cross, God is just saying to anyone who believes in the message of his son, do you know what he says? What God does to anyone who believes in the message of his sons, God just cancels their sins. That's why when you get born again, you are told that it doesn't matter what you did. Oh, it doesn't matter if you accept the message of the son, God cancels all your sins. It's like God, God, it's like God becomes that, um, that, um, that creditor that we had, right? God becomes that creditor that we owed a lot. We were debtors to God. God was this creditor that we owed debts to. But he sent one man. One man came and he paid all their, all our debts. So that's why now Paul concludes and says, yes, God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. God, it's like that debtor. Listen, yo, listen, listen, listen. It's like that creditor that we owed, that creditor that we owed, sent someone, sent his son to say, my son, go and see the reason why those people can't pay me back. Go and see why those people can't pay what they owe me. Go and see why they can't pay me what they owe me. Then the son came down. The son began to say that the reason why those people can't pay is because of sin. It's because of unrighteousness. It's because they have a sinful nature. It's because of the... And the father was like, oh, you know what, my son? Pay for them. Pay, pay, pay what they owe me. So now the son's like, okay, the father submits a, 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 a report to the father as to why we can't live right, as to why we can't please the father, as we why we can't walk with the father, as to why we just fail in meeting his standard. And the father was like to the sons, my son, you know what I want, so do it for them. Do what they can't do, and if you do what they can't do, if anyone believes that you did it for them, I will just cancel their sins. That's why Paul concludes God was in Christ. God was in Christ, um, uh, um, no longer counting people's sins against them, but instead canceling them. And God has given us that same ministry of reconciliation. So Paul concludes and says, now then we are ambassadors of God. We are ambassadors of Christ. And we, we beseech you in Christ's state that be reconciled with God. It's like Paul says, this is the biggest message that we have uh, as ambassadors of Christ, uh, that we go around telling people that, hey, he has canceled the sins. It doesn't matter what you did. You have to come to the light. God wants to cancel your sins. This is the message we preach to the lost that, hey, my brother, you don't have to explain to me what you did. You don't have to tell me that on that day you did this, you killed that, you did that. Hey, God was in Christ no longer canceling people sins. He was cancelling them. Come to the light. Come to the light, brother. Come. You don't have to explain to me nothing. Your sins, he was cancelling them. Listen, listen, listen. Scripture says God himself, the creditor that we owed, he, he came inside his son. He was in his son, going around people that owed him, cancelling, cancelling. If anyone believed his son, he was just going around cancelling their sins. So what are we saying? We're saying, people of God, we must understand the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. We must understand what Christ did. Do you understand? We must understand the things that Jesus Christ accomplished for us, right? And then, okay, the last scripture that we're going to read, which is a scripture that we already spoke about, right? The last scripture that we, we're going to read, let me just read verse 19 and read verse 21 uh, together. I'm going to skip verse 20, right? Verse 19 says, God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not counting people's sins against them, but instead canceling them. For he made him who knew no sin to be made sin for us so that we might be called the righteousness of God. God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not counting people's sins against them, but instead canceling us. How, why did God do that and how did God do it? Verse 21, 4, he did it like this. This is how God did it. This is how God canceled our sins. This is how God uh, reconciled the world unto himself. Verse 21, he made him. This is the key. This is the key, the puzzle, the, the key to this whole puzzle as to how one day when we accepted Jesus Christ, we stood forgiven. This is how God did it. God made him who knew no sin to become sin. Can you see, you, we had no part to play in that. That's why scripture says we are saved by grace. It's grace that saved us. It's not because we wanted to change. It's not because, no, no, no. Your wanting to change can't save you. What saved us is the sacrifice of Jesus Christ when Christ fulfilled all the mosaic, all that the mosaic law required. 
he made a way so that now when we say we believe, God cancels our sins and he removes our names from <laughs> the book that was left in hell there. So as I conclude, people of God, as I conclude, people of God, I want you to understand that um, um, the door stands open in heaven now for you and for anyone that would desire to um, to know the Lord, to seek the Lord. The door, a door stands open in heaven. It's your duty to take that into prayer. Pray with scripture. You know, confess the scripture every night before you go to sleep. Look for scriptures which speak about things that Jesus did for you. Do you understand? Because those things are free gifts to you. They are given to you for free. The struggle is just us believing and living by faith. That's where the struggle is. Do you understand? So, yo, people of God, we've come to the end of the life. Um, we're going to meet on Monday, right? We're going to meet... No, no, not Monday. Yo, 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 please cut, 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 cut. Not Monday, cut, cut. Kilebohile, please, I hope you, you heard. <laughs> because, yeah, I hope you heard that Monday was a mistake, right? Cut, 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 cut. So we're going to meet on Tuesday, right? And when we meet on Tuesday, uh, hi, Bo, hi, Bo, hi, Bo, hi, Bo, Tuesday. We're going to meet on Tuesday and we're going to take questions. And um, just in case there are no questions, I'm just going to be ready with a message. I can't imagine us coming here and say, okay, question time. And there's no question. And we just like this. You're just watching me wondering what we're going to do now. So just in case there is no question, but please remember, I did say that, please don't, we, we, you can't come with questions like, who was God's mother? Yo, guys, please, uh, we don't have time for that. Or you can't come and ask, uh, what, uh, Judah, who was Judah's Iscariot's sister? Ay, 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 please, no, 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 no. We, we need things that make us grow, right? Don't, please, guys, please. I know people. Pela, you think that Christians are, are matured. <laughs> you think that Christians are matured and like people want to grow and people want to ask you questions like, yeah, why did Moses, uh, I, guys, no, no, no. Like we, we want um, scriptures that will help someone. We want uh, questions, sorry, that will help someone. Questions that will break yokes. Questions that will liberate people. Not questions that will ask us and say, hey, why did Jesus resurrect on, why didn't he resurrect on the fourth day? No, please, guys, no, right? So we we want um, real questions, right? So um, you send your question to uh, Dalitzo, you send your question to Mapre, you send your question to Kilibohile, uh, you send your question to who? Yeah, just those three. Uh, Mapre, Dalitzo, and uh okay people of god let me love and leave you um have a good weekend and please like read your bible and pray pray a lot right read your bible and pray a lot and um uh <laughs> i manguru 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 is always complaining <laughs> uh uh yeah so we will meet on uh on Tuesday, Tuesday, 7.30, we are doing... Qu okay, let me pray. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, I give you glory, Lord. I give you honor. I thank you, Lord God, for your word that bring you the light and understanding to the simple. I thank you, Lord God, that your word will establish us even more, Father, in the spirit we shall stand as the people that you made us to be. In Jesus' mighty and awesome name, I pray that, Father God, your word will establish us on a firm foundation which is no other than jesus christ himself who is the chief cornerstone and the rock of our salvation i pray lord god that even as we're going to the weekend i pray that lord god you'll speak to us in dreams you'll speak to us you'll lead us to prayer you'll lead us to the word of god and father god i pray that you grant unto there's people, Lord God, wisdom and understanding. I pray that, Lord God, you grant them this grace to understand scripture so that they may not be tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine and by men who lie and wait to deceive them, Father. I pray that you'll give them this grace to see you, Father, in the scriptures, the grace to see you in prayer, a grace to dream, a grace to see visions, Lord, in Jesus' mighty and awesome name. I pray that, Lord God, you stir up a hunger, stir up a hunger in them, a hunger to seek, Lord God, a hunger to be like that man that Jesus Christ gave us as an, as an example, that the kingdom of God is likened unto a man who was seeking for treasure and he went to look for it. I pray, Lord God, that you give them the hunger of that man, Father, in that parable that Jesus Christ told us about 
about the man who had a desire for treasure and he went to look for it. I pray, Lord God, in Jesus' mighty and awesome name. And I pray that all of them, Father, you'll keep them, you'll protect them, Father, in Jesus' mighty and awesome name, I pray. And I pray for those who are not well in their bodies, Father, I speak healing in Jesus' name, I pray. And everyone says, Amen. Uh, okay, people of God, we've come to the end of our life. And um, yeah, you are blessed. You are blessed. You are blessed. Okay, so let's meet on Tuesday, right? Um, uh, I'll try and upload this video tomorrow morning to YouTube um, so that the YouTubers... <laughs> So that the YouTubers can go watch. Okay, people of God, bye, 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 bye. Thank you, thank you too. Uh, bye.